if you think only of the day-to-day -day objectives, it's yeah. very straightforward. We were passing through a number of unit lines and we didn't know when somebody would open fire at us. And it'll be our own people. Because what the Tamils decide to do is partly political. If you make a mistake, somebody will die. Commanding officer, you get an interview with the commander. Get a color on your label. Get, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you get a medal on you and all that. So my main focus is in interpreting or reinterpreting the Bhagavad Gita again in a language that my kids can understand. What appeared to be absolutely meaningless at that time is building a certain kind of a mindset within them. Understanding the big picture is very important. Probably a different uh, perspective yeah. that um, sometimes it's okay to not know. Sometimes it's better that you uh, wait or follow the orders because somebody else is doing the thinking and all you need True. to do is to ensure that your task is completed. It is and it isn't. Uh, because, you know, as officers, we are supposed to be the thinking element in the, uh, in the military, isn't it? So we are the, what, what they call the directing element. So if we don't know the big picture, I mean, at least at one or two levels above us, you know, I'll, I'll tell you an incident where uh, we had a lull in the operation, so to say, and we decided to visit a resort. And in those days, you know, the east coast of uh, Sri Lanka is full of uh, beach resorts, you know? Correct. So uh, one of the officers got friendly with the, uh, the resort manager. And he said, come over, you know, why don't you come and have lunch with uh, me and my wife? So we, uh, so we went, uh, went across there, um, we spent the whole day on the beach, had lunch uh, with uh, the resort manager, and uh, we, uh, he gave us rooms for the night. And in the middle of the night, when we were all sitting and watching a movie, uh, we get a knock on the door. Right. Knock on the door in the middle of the night. And uh, I, I, I mean, obviously we couldn't understand, we couldn't see through the door, because mm -hmm. you know how hotel, hotel uh, doors are, you know? And there were uh, nine of us, and uh, even, even the commanding officer was there. And um, so we said, no, no, what do we do? We have to open the door, you know? Uh, so we uh, uh, loaded, uh, took positions around the door, around the room, rather. And they said, okay, let's uh, one guy open the door. You know? if, if it is not somebody we recognize, we open fire. And we'll fight through. Uh, <laughs> we opened the door. And it turned out to be an army JCO, a junior commission officer. And he said, Sir, you have to go to the base. The commander said, I have to go to the base. He said, I have to go to the base. We realized that, you know, since there were nine of us and the vehicle can take only four, we decided that we will go with the army patrol back uh, to the base. And it was about, I would say, the distance was about two hours uh, mm. through the jungle. Yeah. And I said, instead of going through the jungles where we are not very sure about who we are likely to meet, because at night through the jungle, it's a very, right. it's not, not sufficient light, no? So I said, let's walk along the beach, you know? Because if you go along the beach, it's just, uh, you know, we may be able to cut the distance by about 40 minutes and we can move much faster. And then I realized that as you walk along the beach, we are, we are fully highlighted against the backdrop of the ocean. And there's a moon shining. The beach is nice and bright. The line of trees at the edge of the beach is completely in the dark. Anybody can take a pot shot of one side. And how do we coordinate, you know, uh, if, if you are passing through another military unit's area of responsibility? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there has been no coordination in advance that this unit uh, of, you know, 30 men will be passing through your unit lines at this okay. time of day. This is a coordination that is done uh, normally in the, in the army. But here we are operating outside the army. Although we got, a, we got a call from the army at that time to come back to base for some reason. We were passing through a number of unit lines and we didn't know when somebody would open fire at us. And it will be our own people. Because all along the, uh, yeah. the coast, we knew there were various um, military pickets. Here. None of the harrowing experiences. But even when they reached our own base, the base to which uh, these boys themselves belong, uh, and uh, they must have been expecting them along the road, but they came along the beach. 
and we know that there are there are lookouts posted who are uh, who are supposed to watch the beach you know they can have open fire because you know if you're in the night you're looking and you see a bunch of people fully armed uh, coming along the beach you know what do you likely do you're not going to sit there and you know say hello they got open fire yeah. but the luckily nothing happened that uh, night you know so these kind of uh, you know there were too many of these ambiguities and they insufficient coordination if you are supposed to operate with the army that would have been one thing but we were not working with the army in fact more often than not we used to be working at cross purposes yeah? because what the channels decide to do is party political mm. they are trying to gain political power in the channel island mm. uh, but they are also militants and they are working against uh, the the country to which they belong sri lanka can you imagine that means we have gone in there we have lost support of the primary political party which is the ltt and we are operating with the secondary political party the opposition <laughs> and they are all militants fully armed and we are disconnected from the army and we are operating in civil and wow. we all grow, grown you know long hair and big beards so much so that the army can't recognize us as soldiers of the indian army and we were selected because we could speak south indian languages <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's the first time i think i began to question on the very logic of you know working in an environment like this and my my biggest worry as a member right so my time in sri lanka was that i'm going to be i'm going to get killed by my own guy mm. in some encounter accidental encounter they they in this a term for it in the military call it's called friendly fire you know this is not friendly fire you know friendly fire okay friendly fire you get killed by your own side mm. that's what it means. okay that's what it means okay yeah so and mostly it's accidental because they didn't they didn't expect you they didn't know you were operating in this area by the look they could make out that uh, uh, you belong to the indian army and they thought you were entity <laughs> <laughs> it's i can say it's the mother of all ambiguous situations yeah, there exactly. can be exactly yeah, yeah that's right you you only have a three year tenure with the nsu and you send back to the army and uh, once i got back to the army i realized that uh, by then i had uh, children so the boys were just uh, you know maybe 4 and 2 or something like that mm. and uh, i uh, you know i looked at my own uh, experience as a child you know growing up in boarding schools right from the age of 5 i said do i really want my children to be growing up growing up without a father so that is when i took a conscious decision and i had just 12 years of service i was a, i had just become a major it's extremely difficult even if you volunteer to leave the army they want army to leave you mm, obviously so, so you why would have, they <laughs> yeah exactly you know you you train the resource and you yes. and at the level of the major which is the uh, you know the the literally the cutting edge of the mm. army uh, they don't want to leave you because they've been training you for not since years and why should they so you apply and you try your luck so i went for my mtech i started doing the course and uh, within a month i had applied to i applied on uh, compassionate grounds i applied uh, when i was uh, with just 12 years of service so which would be considered in those days as premature retirement uh, with no benefits in retrospect i said i must have been mad i don't know what i was thinking because not having the children grow up without a father is one thing not having the financial ability to support a family and and having grown up in the army having known no other life outside of the army here i yeah. was at the age of 34 with a family of four i'm standing on the streets and i'm wondering what i'm going to do next i didn't have a clue even after leaving the army it took me nearly two years before i got my first job and uh, that also luckily uh, i was at the right place and i told you i was doing my mtech yeah and i went across to pune university and i was looking for the main office to see if i can do a course in those days computers was just coming up 
Mm. And computers is something that we were introduced to when we did our BTEC. So I said, uh, and it became a little more enhanced during the MTEC, you know. So I said, is there a computer course that I can do to qualify for this field, IT field? Uh, it was just in its very nascent stages in India at the place. And I accidentally uh, went into uh, an institution called uh, CDAC. Uh, yeah. The Center for. It's a government run organization. It's a government run organization. Yeah. Uh, Vijay Bhatkar, uh, he was the. Uh, and these guys were making supercomputers there. Yes. And because they had this bandwidth, they decided to set up an advanced computer training school because they needed uh, new blood that will uh, be able to take this program forward. And uh, instead of uh, running the school only for their own employees, they opened it up to the general public. So he said, do a program with us. It's a very short program, six months. And um, that will give you all the basic skills to get you started uh, in a new career. So that's what I did. And uh, that is what launched me into IT. And it took me, it took me nearly two years after retirement without salary, without a pension to get my first job as a systems manager with Escorts in Faridabad. It reminds me that it doesn't matter uh, where you find yourself at any given point in time, as long as you're having your head sorted and you can always begin from wherever you are, you can always chart a new path and then surge in that path. So how would you go back and describe this time out of military in the civil world? It was a brilliant opportunity that I had. Mm. And also the rise is meteoric, you know, in the sense that uh, you are at a, a stage of your life where you don't have any backup options, you know. So, um, uh, so you know that, you know, it's, uh, it's do or die. Mm. So you put in all your energy into it and uh, coming from a military background with that kind of a discipline uh, and commitment uh, to any project that you undertake, uh, you can advance very rapidly. Unlike the army, you know, where everything is time bound, I worked in uh, in uh, system management services in escorts uh, for the bus for just about a year before I was picked up by a US company. And uh, they trained me in Bangalore for, uh, for about uh, three to four months. And the first opportunity I got, even during the training, was to go across to Singapore on a consulting assignment. And then uh, I finished that engagement, came back. Uh, I came back to Bangalore because the US company had wanted me to uh, join them in the US. Yes, right. Uh, but when I came back from uh, Singapore, the uh, manager in Singapore, uh, you know, the British guy, he says, you know, can you send this guy back to us because we need, we have vacancies. So then that's how I landed up in Singapore and I spent the next four years in Singapore working with these guys before I moved to the US. So, uh, you know, the, the big difference I realized that uh, in, the, in CV Street is that, you know, if you're good, uh, you know, you can progress very rapidly. Recognition is straight into your bank. Military does recognize, you know, you know they'll yeah. give you a shibashi, you get a letter from the commanding officer, you get an interview with the commander. Get a color on your label. Get a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get a medal on you and all that. But yeah. nothing financially. Financially, you're exactly where you are, you know. And, and then when you try and map that with the... Uh, you know, your plans for your own children, you see that, you know, there's a big mismatch. Here I was, uh, you know, all of a sudden able to afford everything in life. That was a wonderful, right. a wonderful change. So the, the experience of military obviously taught you many things, right? But oh, yes. what have you carried forward or carried over into your civil life? Your discipline, your sense of purpose, your commitment, mm. your sincerity, um, you know, all that. It it gets it gets enhanced in the in the military. It is a it it's it's something that is expected from you. Mm. But in civil street, it becomes you know it suddenly becomes highlighted, and uh, it somehow you get a massive uh, boost in in terms of recognition, and this recognition in in real in real terms. Any project that is given to me, you know, even if I had no clue what it was, mm. I can figure it out and then run with it and leave the team within a very short period of time. Starting from scratch. Starting from scratch, absolutely. Yeah. So that is uh, that, kind of, that kind of discipline, commitment, and energy mm. uh, 
uh, that is all our view. I mean, right. Is there any trait or habit that you wished you had, uh, or you wished you picked up uh, or sustained from your military life? You know, there's one thing about the process of training in the army. You know, and, uh, army is not a new institution. It's 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 one. Of, it's the oldest profession. And um, once you enter the system, you, know, you have to trust the process, and the processes do deliver. Even though mm. a person, uh, a new initiate, you know, who's joining the army for the first time, just doesn't nothing makes sense to it. But that is the system, and uh, that is a process that has been very well defined, and it produces the results you uh, the army desire. You may not know what is happening, but uh, the change. Is very apparent to somebody who's observing you from from the outside. You feel that you haven't changed at all, mm. but somebody who's observing uh, observing you from the outside sees a tremendous amount of change. It's a very well established process, and a lot of youngsters who um, who join they make the mistake of trying to second guess what exactly is happening. <laughs> you know? mm. Why why do I have to march around on this drill square? Uh, you know, coming by and more coming, and once the academy is over, I say thank God. I mean, ये जगह तो छोटी है यहाँ पर रगड़ा तो भी जगना है एक दिन और. And our drill instructor used to warn us, you know, you sweat now because you will never again get an opportunity to step back into the drill square ever again in your life. And we used to say thank God we don't want to step in. And then you realize, you know, what appeared to be absolutely meaningless at that time is building a certain kind of a mindset within you, where you can immediately recognize something that that doesn't fit the picture. You understand? That means any any flaw. Mm. If you are observing something and if you notice a flaw, that flaw immediately stands out. So and uh, and military as such is is a profession where if you make a mistake, somebody will die. Correct. Right. So we can't, you know, we have to remove as much of the flaws as possible during our training period. And this drill gives us the ability to recognize a flaw as soon as you see it, and then correct it. And it's also about mindsets isn't it like you you you're you have to develop a sense of patience you have to develop the same repetitiveness like you said right why are we doing it didn't it did it doesn't sound meaningless but at the same time it actually is teaching a lot of things about yourself i don't know whether you're familiar with the iceberg model i mean this yes, is of course of, yeah yeah subconscious so state yeah yeah so you know you have what is the visible aspect of a character and you have that aspect that is below the line which means your uh, your attitude your values your beliefs uh, that is what motivates and that is the area that is being targeted right so and uh, the, and even though you may not be aware of uh, aware of it but the changes are already happening at that level what is happening to you during the process of training is is never communicated to you directly because the change happens and you accept the change as a part you know as as a, a part of the course and then you move on in your career you know but then when i really realized uh, the impact of all the training that i went through in the army is when i read the bhagavad gita uh, i realized also that you know a lot of the a lot of the translations that are available of uh, sanskrit texts in english they are all wrong and you need to reinterpret and get to the real essence of what is being taught you know the bhagavad gita or the vedas upanishads and all this it is not about uh, you know god yeah. and uh, heaven and hell and uh, sin and yes. all that thing it is about finding yourself it is about finding the perfection within and that perfection within when you aim for that perfection and you progress towards that perfection and you build your life mm. seeking that perfection that is what causes all that changes that happen below the line the army the drill square may be a practical aspect in right. our tradition they call it the agama from mm. sort of but the theory underlying it is there in the vedas and the upanishads and the bhagavad gita 
that this is uh, when I read this and I, when I really began to understand it is the first time. And imagine I'm talking about something that happened 50 years ago. Yeah. And now is when I begin to understand. And I wish somebody had uh, spoken to us about the Bhagavad Gita when we were in the academy. It would have made a very different me. Maybe I would have never left the army. You know? Maybe I would have had my priorities sorted. You know? Yeah, the family is important, but it's not as if the uh, military officers don't have family. Even today, they are serving the military. They all have families, and they're doing very well. The flaw is always in you, never in the institution. And once you begin to think wrong, and you get the wrong perception, uh, then uh, you're on your way out. <laughs> because the army will continue. <laughs> you're out. That's awesome. So, so are, are your kids in military, or they chose uh, other uh, path? My elder son wanted to join the Air Force. Uh, right. And at that time, I was uh, I was in the U.S., you know, so he thought he could join the U.S. Or Air Force. You know? I said, no, you can't join the U.S. Air Force. You could join the Air Force of your own country. Yeah. So he was very keen to join, you know, and, uh, you know, luckily what happened is that he watched a television program called Mission Udan. It's like a reality show, you know. Okay. Take a bunch of youngsters and put them through the paces and send them to the Air Force Academy. And my son saw that and he says, oh my God. He saw them getting punished in the Air Academy. <laughs> he said, do all that? <laughs> that was the end of them of joining the Air Force, you know. So he's, but he is a flyer. He uh, he flies for um, Air Asia. Okay. Oh, he's a commercial pilot. Commercial. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> he, he says he, um, he I told him he, 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 it's a bus driver's job. <laughs> <laughs> right. That brings me to the new avatar you have, which is authoring the books. You're authoring two books, you said, uh, simultaneously. Yeah, so could you give a little gist of it? A bunch of books. A <laughs> bunch of books at the same time? At the same time. Wonderful. You know, it depends on my, uh, you know, I'm a very moody guy that way. <laughs> so you know, sometimes uh, you know, I, 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 I began to write the history and philosophy of the Hindu, okay. and then I realized that the project is so massive; it's going to that if I complete the project, it will be about two thousand page volume. So that's yeah. like an encyclopedia, and I said I can't, I can't deliver that in one piece. Um, because it covers the history of India for the last 100,000 years. And this is also not what is written in our history books. So it is, uh, it is a, uh, it's a, I mean, if I publish a book like this, it, it, will, it is bound to be controversial. Because it is not accepted history. It is a right. reinterpretation of history based on our texts. And uh, we don't know for sure, for example, when the Mahabharata happened. We don't know for sure when the Ramayana happened. But there are researchers who are working on it and uh, uncovering the dates. Because right. the date is in the text itself, but not in the format that you're familiar with. It'll, they'll give you, uh, you know, some uh, alignment of stars and occlusion of a star or, or the moon right. in some phase or... Uh, with some back background of some constellation. So it's our typical lunar calendar dates, you know. Yeah. And that is given as a, as a verse in the Mahabharata and Ramayana. So you have to then understand what this, uh, what the verse says, interpret it, put that data into a software like a planetarium, and then try to reverse, uh, reverse time in order to come up with that alignment of, of planets or stars, you know. Wow. If you look at the interpretations, you know, it'll look like, you know, um, remedial theology. My, uh, so my main focus is in interpreting or reinterpreting the Bhagavad Gita again in a language that my kids can understand, which means the generation of today, they will be able to understand. Mm -hmm. so that, is the, uh, that is the interpretation of the Bhagavad Gita. And then... Uh, what started off as a project on the history and philosophy, the the whole history of the development uh, of uh, of India as a nation, mm. and how the philosophy of the Hindu came to be realized. That is the story I'm writing as a journey of one person from the year uh, 100,000 BC 
till today. That means if we are, I'm trying to create a thread right through the past 100,000 years of Indian history and then, then build the philosophy into his life story. Wonderful. History is really fascinating. And I'm uh, personally also uh, started digging a little deeper into it, including the Bhagavad Gita, although I'm not writing or interpreting any book. For me, it is the interpretation of what I can carry into my workspace or, or some uh, uh, elements of leadership learning that you get out of a particular verse. So that is something that I do. So and thank I- you so much, Major Ranjeev Kurup, for all what you've spoken to us, your stories, the fascinating, inspiring uh, journey that you've had, uh, both in the military as well as out of it. And now with this new hat as a uh, new hat of being an author. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Take care.